after I moved to Costa Rica, my brother came to visit me. We took the slow, hot bus out from San Jose to the National Park in Manuel Antonio. We'd gotten off too early, so we were walking down the mountainside. I was hangry and getting desperate for food. We found a little roadside diner and I said, let's just eat here. My brother, not realizing quite how hungry I was, said, suggested that if we were going to eat, we should go back up the mountain a little ways to a neat looking restaurant he'd spotted on the way down. I was not keen to walk back up the mountain at all and I was super hungry. And so I yelled at him and told him that this was where we were going to eat. And we sat down on the roadside and ate. I think I remember that of all things, it was like a cafeteria quality ha hamburger and french fries. Yes, in Costa Rica. After we were on the way back up the mountain to where we were staying, I noticed how nice that other place looked and realized that it was literally about 50 feet behind where we had been just around the curve. We actually ended up eating there later and it was really good with really nice views. And if I'd had enough patience to calmly assess the situation and trust that my brother had indeed seen a nice place to eat just a little way back, we would have had a much nicer meal and a chance to relax after our long, hot journey and before we went hiking in the rainforest. My impatience caused me to lash out at my brother and to engage a solution that, while it did work in the sense that we got calories in our bodies, it wasn't as ideal as if I'd had the patience to wait just a little longer. We got fed, but we could have had a better meal and a better experience if I hadn't lost my cool. This is, of course, not the only time I've ever rushed to an imperfect solution in the face of the desire to get the thing over with. Sarah and Abraham were dealing with the consequences of their own rush to find a solution to their most pressing problem. They were preoccupied with their lack of children, even in the face of God's famous promise to Abraham that his descendants would number the stars. Instead of being patient with God and allowing things to happen on God's time, they rushed to use the Egyptian woman they were enslaving, Hagar, to produce an heir. And then when Hagar's pregnancy made Sarah feel jealous and inadequate, Sarah abused her so much and Abraham refused to stand up for her, that she fled into the wilderness. There, she received an annunciation from God and was told to name her child Ishmael, meaning God hears. In this moment of distress, Hagar, an Egyptian, a slave and an outsider, became the only person in the Hebrew Bible to give God a name, the God who sees. And in today's continuation of that story, now that Sarah has given birth to the long-awaited Isaac, she sees both Hagar and Ishmael as threats. So she has Abraham send them away. And again, Abraham doesn't stand up for Hagar. Twice now we see Hagar desperate in the wilderness, but the wilderness is where God meets us. God responds to these cries, this time from her son Ishmael, cast underneath a bush by his despairing mother to die, and responds. Ishmael's name comes from the same root as the Shema, the prayer said by Jews daily to proclaim their faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The verb means to hear and to respond. God is not just listening. God is hearing with the intent to intervene and respond in this life or death situation. When Ishmael cries, God hears him. When Hagar wonders where God could be, God sees her. We're often taught to think of God as if our prayers should always get the exact results we're looking for and on our timeline too. But that's not how God works. When bad things happen, when unfair things happen, when terrible things happen. God sees us and hears us and God responds. Maybe not on our time and often not in our way, but often our frustration comes from our desire to control the outcome, something we don't actually get to do. 
Abraham and Sarah live under the illusion that they can control the outcome of their lives, or at least that they can maybe work to hurry God up a little, because they have at least some power as a result of their status in society. But their attempts at control end remarkably badly every time. Hagar is the perfect foil to Abraham and Sarah, in part because she has no other option but to trust. In her situation, she doesn't have the power to tell anyone what to do. She can't make the choice to abuse anyone, and she can't really protect herself from their abuse. In her powerlessness, she has no other option but to trust that the God who sees and hears will see and hear her. When we've got power, it's easy to think that we can get to be in charge. We're told that anything is possible if we only believe in ourselves. But that's not really true, is it? Sometimes life throws us curveballs, a diagnosis, a central relationship that falls apart, a job that doesn't work out, an application that doesn't get accepted, an injury, a death, a loss. And if, despite dealing with cataclysmic forces beyond our control, we fail to give ourselves grace, lose our trust in the God who sees and hears our cries for help, and try to ram through unaltered plans on our own timeline, it can end badly. Glennon Doyle wisely reminds us that everything isn't possible. But some things are possible. Some beautiful, wonderful things are possible if we let go of the idea that everything must happen in the way we've decided it must happen. And some beautiful, wonderful things are possible when we hear and see the ways that God is moving in our lives, even in the midst of times when we feel like everything is going badly. God, who cares, even for the smallest sparrow, cares for you too. God sees you and hears you. Even when we think everything is lost, in trusting God's promises to us, we find new life springing forward. Just maybe not quite 